Hello, and welcome to the lecture on chapter 33, where we're going to talk about the atomic nucleus and when it is radioactive and what that means. Okay, so one thing we're going to talk about is X-rays and how they're related to radioactivity. Also, alpha, beta, and gamma rays, which aren't all light, although you might think rays are light. Turns out some of these aren't. The name is uh, historical baggage. But we'll talk about those. We'll talk about environmental radiation, you know, kind of this, the, ra the radiation that's around us. It's just part of the natural world. Then we'll talk about the atomic nucleus and the strong force, which is one of the fundamental forces. Okay, it is the force that actually holds the atomic nucleus together. We'll talk about a kind of computational idea, which is how we calculate half-lives and how that is so useful for so many applications. Radiation detectors, transmutation of elements, because it turns out that many of the radioactive decay processes create new elements, and that's called transmutation. Radioactive decay is not the only form of transmutation, but essentially it is the idea of changing one element into another. Pretty neat idea. And then finally, a definitive application of um, radioactive half-lives, which is how we can date things using radiometric half-lives. Okay. All right. So now let's get started. First, x-rays and radioactivity. Now this is a good place to start because historically it's where things began. So Röntgen discovered x-rays produced by a beam of electrons striking the glass surface of a gas discharge tube. But what was creating these x-rays? What were they? Well, he found that the x-rays could pass through solid materials, could ionize the air because they carried so much energy, showed no refraction in glass, and were undeflected by magnetic fields. So those are such important discoveries because what that told Rotengen and his peers was that x-rays were not charged particles. They were not like electrons or alpha particles like, uh, like, Ruth like Rutherford used in his discovery of the atomic nucleus. Instead, these were a form of light, but a very unusual form of light because they were extremely high powered light. Now, we might think of x-rays as being something that is used you know, throughout many applications in the modern world, but they, they're not really naturally occurring. Although there are a lot of x-rays in space at the time of Rotengen, people weren't going to outer space and x-rays don't make it through our atmosphere. So what are they? They are high frequency electromagnetic waves usually emitted by the de-excitation of the innermost, innermost orbital electrons of atoms. Okay, So though they're not coming from the nucleus itself, and that's the, the idea for this whole chapter is talking about the atomic nucleus, they are so close to the nucleus, they're very much influenced by it. So imagine a large atom that has many electrons, maybe 30, 40, 60 electrons, and those, the ones that are most closely packed down to the nucleus have very high energy excitation levels. Usually they don't get excited. The, the outermost electrons are the ones that are probabilistically going to get excited. But if you send a high enough energy to match their energy quantized states, then they will get excited, and then of course they'll go through a de-excitation as well. And when they do, they emit very high energy light. All right? So an energetic beam of electrons striking a solid surface excites those innermost, inner, innermost electrons because those electrons carry a lot of energy, you know, being more energy than you, say, if you were trying to just shine ultraviolet light on the glass or something, you'd never get x-rays as, as a product. But if you have very high-speed electrons and they hit, they hit the atomic nucleus just right, they can, they can actually excite those innermost electrons. And then you've got your very high energy photon, which is X radiation, X radiation, okay? X rays, X radiation, same, you know, two ways to say it. Everyone says X rays. Now, you know, the name is very evocative of the discovery because no one knew what they were. We still call them X rays, but now we know they're light. All right, so X-ray photon, photon of course being a particle of light, have high energy and can penetrate many layers of atoms before being absorbed or scattered. Okay, so they have so much energy they can pass through things that other types of light can't. They do this when they pass through your soft tissue to produce an image of the bones inside your body. Now we know they can also cause you know, mutations in the cells and just, just cell death, right? So that's why they have to be used sparingly, but they absolutely have an amazing ability to penetrate. Okay, so how are they related to radioactivity? Well, radioactivity is the process of nuclear decay it's, there's nothing new in the environment. It's been going on since the very beginning of the Big Bang, right? It's, it's been ever, well, maybe after, you know, a few, a few hours after the Big Bang when the first atoms were being created. It warms Earth's interior. It's very important, actually, for a planet of our size to still have heat and still have a, a mantle, right, and volcanoes and tectonics and all of that. And it is present in all rocks, all right? Some in tiny, tiny amounts. It's very much a natural phenomenon. So you can't just write off radioactivity as, a, as something that's a byproduct of the, the nuclear power industry. Okay, 
So the radioactive decay of nature's elements occurs in what? Well, I bet you know the answer. All of them, right? It's everywhere. It happens abundantly in the atmosphere, and it happens in many, not many um, organisms as well. Okay, so in order to talk about radioactivity, the, the main focus, kind of the, I'd say the main idea, the, the idea that I always focus on whenever I present the subject, are the three main types of products from the atomic nucleus. And those are called alpha, beta, and gamma rays. Also sometimes called alpha, beta, and gamma particles. And I'll probably use that term as I'm describing them, okay? Now these are all coming from the atomic nucleus itself. Now the atomic nucleus can also release x-rays through a number of, number of processes, including quantized energy levels of the protons themselves inside the atomic nucleus. Um, and sometimes one type of radioactive decay will, will lead to an excited, an excited nucleus and thus a eventual relaxation of that nucleus and a release of an x-ray. Sometimes those x-rays are so high powered we even call them gamma rays, which is kind of a, a continuum between what's a high powered x-ray and what's a low powered gamma ray, right? The jury's out. And I bring that up just to kind of tie in the idea of the first discovery of x-rays. And really, the, maybe the biggest tie-in is that we're talking about high energy phenomenon here. If there's one real kind of common theme is that these particles, whether they are the x-rays from the nucleus or the innermost electrons, whether they are gamma, gamma, or, um, gamma rays, which turn out are just light, right? Or if they're beta or alpha particles, which are actual protons and electrons, whatever they may be, they all carry a lot of energy. Now, they might not carry much energy in total because they may be very low, low in amount. So if you only have a couple of atoms per trillion atoms that are, that are emitting these particles, then it's almost unnoticeable. But when they're, when they're in large amounts, then they're almost always going to be noticeable. Okay, so the radioactive elements, which are you know, the isotopes and, and the, are all the larger elements, you know, so just there's so many of them, emit three distinct types of radiation. Alpha, okay, Greek letter alpha, what are alpha particles? Now, these are good to memorize. They are positively charged, and they're actually the helium nucleus. They're the, they're the nuclei of helium atoms, okay? Now, they're not literally coming from helium atoms, but they, they are identical to the nucleus of a helium atom because they're two protons and two neutrons, okay? That's an alpha particle. Very, very common for that to be emitted from the atomic nucleus. Then we have beta particles, okay? Beta particles are negatively charged because they're electrons. They're, that's, they're just honestly electrons. Now, it seems weird that electrons are coming from the nucleus. It should, but that's exactly what's happening, okay? It actually has to do with something called the weak nuclear force, which we don't really cover in this class, and that's okay. And then finally, gamma particles, represented by the Greek letter gamma, and these are electromagnetic. They're not charged particles. They don't have mass. Okay, and because of this, because the three distinct types of the, of the most common types of radiation, because one is positively charged, one is negatively charged, and the other is light, which is inherently neutral, they all behave very differently when, pre when presented to a magnetic field. So it, they're actually quite easily to, easy to detect in that regard and differentiate, because we can see that the gamma particles, since they, they again, they don't carry charge, they'll pass right through a magnetic field without being deflected. The alpha particles will get deflected in one direction, the beta particles will get deflected in the opposite direction. Right? Absolutely, well, 180 degrees to the, the deflection direction of the alpha particles, the positively charged ones. Furthermore, the beta particles being negatively charged, but about a thousand times less massive, actually 4,000 times less massive than the alpha particles, will get deflected much more, right? Because they have less momentum. Okay, now, so that's about their deflection, but we might care about their penetration because one thing is that radiation has a bad rep, and you know, rightfully so in large amounts. And so one thing you want to consider is how do you protect yourself from radiation? And to consider that, we can consider the relative penetration power of these different particles. Okay, so the most massive ones are most easily stopped. So the alpha particles can be stopped by a simple piece of paper. So they, they penetrate very little. They basically cannot penetrate human skin. Okay, so alpha particles will not penetrate human skin. On the other hand, beta particles can penetrate tissue, and, well, thin tissue like skin, but can be stopped by a thin sheet of metal like aluminum, okay? They can also be stopped by bone, okay? All right, and in many cases, clothing. Now, on the other hand, alpha particles are very hard to stop. You need a substantially thick amount of lead to stop them, okay? Sometimes many centimeters or inches of lead to actually stop these. They're incredibly difficult to stop, okay? I mean, case in point, think about those x-rays, how they could penetrate all the way down to the bone, right? Gamma particles are more powerful than x-rays, they're light, and they can pass right through bone. So you need lead to stop them. There's basically a dense, a dense material, right? You could also stop them with other things like gold, but lead is more readily available. Okay, so what are the origins <clears throat> of radioactivity, right? What is it, right? Did we, is this something we made, right? No, no, 
Absolutely not, right? It's always been around, like I said, from a few minutes after the Big Bang. Okay? So any atom that emits an alpha particle or beta particle, what's the best answer here? Becomes an atom of a different element, may become an atom of a different element, becomes a different isotope of the same element, or increases its mass. Okay? So think, think about the atomic nucleus, composed of protons and neutrons. And if we're emitting charge, then we must be changing the, the net charge inside the atomic nucleus. And if we're changing the net charge inside the atomic nucleus, then we must be changing the element every single time. Okay? Now it turns out that the, kind of the direction of where we go on the periodic table is different for alpha and beta, but they're both a change. Okay? They both always change the element. Okay? So this is truly transmutation. It's truly changing one material to another, changing lead into gold, okay? for example. All right? So it can be used to irradiate food, kills microbes. All right? And so it's used in some cases. You can actually irradiate food and have food that doesn't rot because all those naturally occurring, you know, that's why you bring something in your house and you can keep it sealed up and it still rots because there's just resting spores from bacteria and fungi all the time. We eat them all the time, but they're harmless in small amounts, right? When they start, you know, sporulating like crazy, that's when they can become harmful, all right? Upset our tummies. But we, we don't have that if we irradiate it ahead of time. Now, this isn't done on a wide scale, but certainly it's done for astronauts. Okay. So which of these is the nucleus of the helium atom? Okay, if you're paying attention, you know. It's the alpha particle. Two protons and two neutrons. Okay, that is the atomic nucleus of a hydrogen atom. Okay, it's got an atomic number of four. Okay, and it's got an atomic mass number of four. And it's got an atomic number of two. Okay, because remember, the atomic number is the number of protons. The atomic mass number is the total number of nucleons. So that's why it would be mass number of four, atomic number of, of two. Let me write that down. Okay, so mass number equal to four, and then atomic number, which is the way the periodic table is basically oriented, the way it's, um, it's organized, the atomic number would be two. Okay, and furthermore, the atomic number is the one that determines what that element is. We distinguish elements by their atomic number, which is the number of protons. Okay, so which of these is actually a high-speed electron? Bet you know. It's the gamma, okay? Um, oh, I don't know why I said that. It's the beta, right? Obviously not the gamma, gamma's light, okay? Now, it's a high energy light, maybe I was thinking that, but obviously, and really, it is obvious, I'm sorry, sorry if I just made it sound like it wasn't, but really, the, the high energy electron, the electron is the beta, okay? It's, that is actually an electron, absolutely. It's a high speed electron, okay? Okay, so radon, a common environmental hazard, okay? So. Most radiation from natural background, about one fifth from non-natural sources. So check that out, right? So all the, you know, all the modern world, every, every, all the radiation that we've you know, produced through nuclear power plants or other processes, that still is, is very small compared to the natural occurring radiation. In particular, radon in the air is the, is the biggest source. I mean, right, you know, it's together with cosmic rays and earth minerals, it's 75%, right? And radon really, really is a big one, right? But you can live your whole life and not have, your harm, not have it harm you, okay? Because it, it's an amount that obviously we've evolved to handle, okay? Now, how do we, quant, how do we quantify radiation? Because one, one really, you know, kind of from a medical, medical you know, um, standpoint, how do we think about exposure to radiation? Well, we do that through the idea of dosages and factors, okay? So if we have a particle, like an alpha particle, then we say that alpha particle has one rat, Okay? On the other hand, a beta particle has 10 rads. Okay? So that's, that's the actual radiation level. And the reason for that is you would have to have, okay, you'd have to have 10 times as much of the alpha particle to get 10 rems, where you'd only need one times as much as the beta particle to get 10 rems. All right? And then lethal doses begin at 500 rems. So notice then that the health effect is measured in rems, but the physical effect is measured in rads, okay? And the, so that's important because the alpha particle has fewer rads, okay? And the beta particle has more. Think about that penetrating ability and that really gives you an idea why the beta particle, even though it's an electron, is you know, 4,000 times smaller, it's not the size, it's the penetration power that makes it harmful to living cells, okay? So further summarizing, sources, um, sources of rems, notice that this is in millirems, so this is a rem, 
times 10 to the negative three, so a thousandth of a rem, okay? So we have cosmic radiation, 33 millirem, millirems, the ground, just the soil itself on average, also 33. Here I mentioned radon's a big one, okay? It's a particular, and this is radon 222. So when I say radon 222, that is the particular isotope of radon, okay? Because 222 is the atomic mass, that's the total number of nucleons. And so then if we look up the elemental number of radon and subtract the, the atomic number from the atomic mass, that would tell us how many neutrons there are. There's definitely more neutrons than protons, as there are for any relatively large atom. And it turns out that, that radi radon-222 is very common and fairly radioactive and is a big source of REMS. But still, it's millirems, right? And these doses, by the way, these, these are doses annually, so it's per year. So you think about an entire lifetime, and you think of this, this one is about, well, you know, this one is about a fifth of a rem, right? Because it's about, about, a, you know, about 200 millirems. And so then, you know, let's say, you know, you live, you know, 100 years, right? Let's say generously you live 100 years. Well, then you think you're getting a fifth of a rem every year. And so then every five years is one rem. So that means that you're getting a total of 20 rems from the air into your entire life, okay? Well, let's look. But that's nowhere close to 500, right? And 500 is, is that, that's, a, that's, a, you know, that's a really conservative amount, right? You know, that, that's saying that like, that's, that, that outright will kill you, okay? Well, I mean, you're gonna die from something else when you're 100 years old, okay? Does that make sense? So really, you know, these natural sources of radiation aren't a cause of death in their own right, okay? Human tissue itself releases radiation throughout the body, okay? All right, and then we've got um, other, other sources, um, human origin sources. Right, we can see the diagnostic x-rays actually are way more significant, way more than, you know, like they just, you know, be living near a power plant, way, way more, okay? Now, I mean, there are obviously exceptions if something goes horribly wrong with a power plant, like in Chernobyl, but, you know, for the most part, your biggest, your biggest source of man-made radiation is x-rays that you get on your teeth or, you know, if you break a bone or something, okay? On average, right? Nuclear diagnostics, TVs, consumer products like cell phones, right? But these are all very small because, again, these are in millirems. Right? You can use them your whole life and never get anything close to a lethal dose, okay? Now, besides maybe, you know, stressing the point that radiation itself isn't, you know, isn't the devil, right? We shouldn't just worry about it just because it's we've heard bad things, right? We got to understand it before we worry about it, okay? And we have to have a, you know, a realistic approach to how we're going to handle it. But besides that, there are so many applications of radiation, okay? And let's discuss some of them. So one of them is using radiation to, for, to make tracers. So radioactive isotopes can be used to trace pathways through, you know, say like the root system of a tree, um, you know, through the, like the blood vessels of an animal. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's widely used to maybe find, you know, clots in your, in your, you know, your blood system in humans, okay? So you just put a small amount of something radio radioactive and then you can find out where it is because you can then use a detector to find out where the radiation has gone. And you can even find out how long it takes to get there because you can detect it until it gets there, okay? All right, so let's get back to fundamental physics here and talk about the strong force, okay? So the strong force, and this is what you need to remember, holds the nucleons together. So it actually holds the nucleus together. It holds protons with neutrons together, collectively making the nucleus. And really what it does is it opposes, opposes the electrostatic repulsive force that wants to pull the protons apart. Because you think about it, protons don't want to be next to each other. They have like charge. If you take two protons in a vacuum and try to push them next to each other, they will just accelerate, from, accelerate away from each other if you release them. So what's holding them together? It's the strong nuclear force. It's, a, it's an actual total separate force from gravity and electro, electrostatics, so all of electromagnetism. It is different physics, okay? We can't get into the whole idea, but other than to say that it is a separate force, okay? And the strong nuclear force is very attractive when the protons are close together. It overwhelms the electric repulsive force. See, the electric repulsive force is, this is like on a, a scale of strength here, is strong, but it's not as strong as the strong force. But as soon as you bring the protons just a reasonable distance apart, and you know, just really like nanometers, then what's gonna happen is the strong nuclear force falls off precipitously. I mean, it falls off really fast, it zeroes out. And then of course, then the electric force, being repulsive, since they're like charges, will overwhelm them and they're gonna, they're gonna accelerate away, they'll race away from each other. And so that means there's always a tipping point. There's always, always an ability for a nucleus to just, to just tear itself apart, given the right conditions, all right? And we'll come back to that in the next chapter when we talk about nuclear fission. Okay, say splitting, splitting the atom, right? That's the whole idea, is that splitting the atom, it, it's possible because all you have to do is get the distance greater. Because the strong force is a strange force. It actually has a very, like I said, a very, very limited radius of, of, of strength and then just falls off. It's not like a one over R squared relationship. It just kind of goes from 
very strong, right down to zero. And it really, its, its distance is on the scale of about 10 to the negative 11 meters. And the atomic nucleus, like a small one, like, like hydrogen, is 10 to the negative 12, right? So the idea there is that the 10 in the, and this would be in meters. So, the, so a small nucleus like hydrogen, 10 in the negative 12 is about 10 times smaller than the range of the strong force. But once we start getting up the really big ones that are you know, 10 or 20 times bigger than, than a hydrogen, then they're really pushing the limits of the strong force being, being, being able to hold that nucleus together. Okay, so the atomic nucleus and the strong force. The strong force is more effective with smaller nuclei, as I said, so it works really well, right, for, you know, for small things. But once the nucleus gets really big, you know, you're, you're maxing out that range. Maybe this, maybe this is your 10, 10 to the 11, right? Negative 11, right? And so, you know, it's still a hold it together, but just barely. It doesn't take much to tear it apart. So a lone neutron is, a lone neutron is radioactive and spontaneously transforms to a proton and to an electron. So this, this is an interesting idea. Now this technically is not the strong force. This actually happens because of the weak nuclear force, okay? But we don't, we don't call it out. It's not, not a term you're gonna be um, responsible for. So just think of it as another nuclear force, okay? But the, the weak nuclear force is what allows this um, phenomenon to happen. So every neutron is always just waiting to become a proton plus an electron. Okay, every single time, all right? Now, it can also go the other way. You can, you can smash an electron and the proton together and make a neutron, okay? That's actually what happens in neutron stars, being big stars when they die, they become neutron stars. It's actually the process, it's amazing, okay? So, here is a good picture to kind of remind you of what's going on with our, our two types of um, radioactive decay, you know, radioactive processes that emit something other than light, that being alpha emission and, um, well, alpha emission and uh, beta emission, excuse me, here's beta emission, okay? All right, so we can see here, here is a beta particle being ejected, okay? And here is an alpha particle being ejected, all right? The beta particle, it must, where, where did it come from? It came from a neutron, right? I hinted at that. I'm like, that's strange. Why, why are electrons coming from the nucleus? Because what happened is we had a proton that was formed, a new proton, right? Because it was a neutron, it became a proton, and it emitted an electron. Now, technically, there's also some, there's also a process called, called um, beta negative, or sorry, beta positive decay. This is called beta negative decay. Beta positive decay is when a proton becomes a neutron, and in doing so, it actually emits something called a positron. Positrons will quickly become annihilated when they come into contact with an electron. We're not going to cover them in this class. So for us, the only type of, of um, beta decay that we care about is the type where a proton is formed because a neutron became a proton and emitted an electron in the process. Notice that the charge is conserved. That's an idea I've, I mentioned before. Charge is always conserved, okay? And then the alpha particle, it's like a whole chunk came off. So it's actually quite interesting because think about it here, the atomic number for beta decay, the atomic number is conserved. It's unchanged, okay, All right? And for alpha, it's not. The atomic number goes down by four. So there's a big difference there. One of them changes the atomic number, the other just switches things around. See that? Beta doesn't change the atomic number, alpha does, okay? So the strong force is a force that does what? Mm -hmm. Yep, it holds the nucleus together, okay? Is the nucleus of an atom, in the nucleus of an atom, the strong force is a relatively, well, you know, it's a short range force, incredibly so, right? 10 to the negative 12, that's not much range, all right, or negative 11. The rate of decay for a radioactive isotope is measured in terms of a, of a characteristic time, the half-life. Maybe you've heard of it. The time for half the original quantity of the element to decay. All right? Now, this doesn't apply to, it wouldn't apply to humans. Humans don't, don't you know, just spontaneously decay, right? Humans, you know, reach kind of the end, like a, you know, a finite end and we die, right? All organisms do. And so the idea is that this is a very different way to deal with a population. So we might say population of particles or population of atoms, but you can't apply the same idea to a population of people because people are much more likely to die in their 80s than they are when they're eight, okay? On the other hand, an atom is equally likely to die at any point. And by die, we mean transmutate, radioactively decay to some other element, okay? So for example, if we have a sample of one kilogram after a particular amount of time, the half-life, which in this case is 16, 20 years, okay, this is just an example, that's the half-life, okay, at that point, half the original population, shown here in turquoise, is left, and the other half has become something else. It has transmutated, okay, it's not gone, it's just become a different element, and so that, that would be the half-life. Now, if we wanted to find out how long it would take for 
three quarters of the original population to transmutate into the new element, then we'd have to have two half-lives, which would be 3,240. And that means we'd have a half of a half or a quarter kilogram in terms of mass of the original sample. You get that? So you just divide by two over and over again. After three half-lives, you've got a half of a half of a half, an eighth. After four half-lives, you have a half of a half of a half of a half, a sixteenth, right? You get the idea, okay? So now that process of decaying is actually quite complicated for big elements like uranium because they decay for one thing, but then the next thing that's created is also radioactively, you know, radioactive, so then it will decay, and they have different time frames in which they'll do, they have different half-lives, but you get what's called a decay chain. Okay, so uranium-238 turns into lead-206 through a series of alpha and beta decays. It takes 4.5 billion years, and half the uranium present in the Earth will be lead after that, that amount of time. Okay, and what's so great about this table, not to make it complicated and say, oh, look, you know, here's one particular system you need to memorize, because you don't, but just to really see what a decay chain looks like in terms of the two types of processes, because there's only two. There's just alpha and beta. So look at this, this arrow here. This arrow is a wonderful example of alpha decay because we are decreasing the atomic number, okay, by two, right? See, notice, notice the decrease in atomic number went from 90, 90, um, let's see, so 92, okay, because it started at 92 right here, okay? It went down to this square right here, which, cor which corresponds to 90, okay? So it went from 92 to 90, okay? That makes sense because alpha particles, okay, alpha particles, they carry away two protons, so that would decrease the atomic number by two. That's what we see. But they also carry away two neutrons, okay? So that means they should decrease the atomic mass by not two, but four, because then we're gonna count the protons again, because when we count the atomic mass, we count protons plus neutrons. And notice, that's what happened. We went from 238 to 234. So this era, this arrow, this example of alpha decay clearly shows a decrease in two in the atomic number and a decrease of four in the atomic mass. On the other hand, our beta decay, and again, this is, this is you know, beta positive decay, what we have, or excuse me, beta negative decay, but we'll just call it beta decay. Again, don't worry about that. Um, and so what happens in that case, it actually goes the opposite direction. Well, how is that possible? Because remember, a neutron became a proton. So if a neutron becomes a proton, that means that your atomic mass is unchanged, which is why it stayed in the same, the same row, the vertical position didn't change, but that means you have an extra proton. Well, an extra proton means your atomic number has gone up. So with beta decay, you get one new proton. And that means that your, your, your atomic mass will always go up, excuse me, your atomic number will always go up by one. And we see that right, right there. That's an example of beta decay, okay? So they're very different. One moves to the right on a, on a chart like this, that's beta decay. The other moves to the left and down, and that's alpha decay. Okay, so a certain isotope has a half-life of 10 years. This means the amount of that isotope remaining at the end of 10 years will be what? Hmm? Half, right? Half life doesn't mean it's all gone after 10, 10 years, it just means you have half as much. Okay, so suppose the number of neutrons in a reactor that is starting up doubles each minute. Because this is applying the idea of half lives but for you know, doubling, exponential growth. So reaching one billion neutrons in 10 minutes, when did the number of neutrons reach half a billion? Think about it, right? It doubles every minute, okay? So if it reached 1 billion in 10 minutes, then it must have reached half a billion one minute earlier, which would be nine minutes. Get that? All right, because it's, it's easy to get that wrong. But once you, once you figure it out, it will make sense. So we get some, do some practice with these, okay? All right, so how do we detect radiation? Well, you can use Geiger counters, right? They detect incoming radiation by a short pulse of current triggering radiation ionizes the gas in the tube. So they create a pathway for the current to, to um, do the ionization. The other type of detector is called a scintilla scintillation counter, and it indicates incoming radiation by flashes of light produced when the charged particle or gamma ray passes through the counter, okay? So two, two different methods, just to be clear, these are the primary ways that radiation is detected. They're both very effective. Tons, tons of great engineering has, have made these readily available and very effective, okay? One, one, probably the earliest way that radiation was separated into the alpha, beta, and gamma was through something called a cloud chamber. This is kind of cool. This is the idea that the charged particles moving through a supersaturated vapor will leave trails because they'll ionize that vapor. And, you can, and it actually happens on the scale of like, the, the trails will, will remain in the clouds for seconds and then they'll finally fade away. There's actually one of these at the Lawrence Hall of Science, which is a children's museum in Berkeley. And it's, it's operational and, just, and you can actually see particles being released under glass, right? The, truly, it's not a video, it's actually happening. 
When the chamber is in a strong electromagnetic field, bending of the tracks provide information about the charged particles. Because remember, the, the, um, the, uh, the alpha particles, they'll bend in one direction, but they'll kind of take a wide bend because they're fairly massive. And then the beta particles will bend in the opposite direction, but they'll take a real tight bend because they don't have a lot, of, um, a lot of inertia. They don't have a lot of momentum. All right. A bubble chamber is the same idea. Um, but instead of ionizing a trail in a gas, it's, um, it's creating little bubbles in a particular type of material, right? And here's a, a picture of one, all right? So let's go and review transmutation a little bit more, make sure we're clear on the ideas. So on alpha or, when, when alpha or beta particles, a different element is formed, or with alpha and beta particles. So anytime they're released through radioactive decay, a natural process, there's always a new element formed. I think I've, I've said that enough, I hope that's clear. This is called transmutation. Cool word for it, right? Makes you think about alchemists, right? It's actually taking, you know, that's the, the word that's used in that context. But this is the real kind, okay? So which occurs in natural events and is also initiated artificially in the laboratory. So you can stimulate radioactive decay, okay? Um, it, we don't, we're not particularly concerned about it. We'll talk about stimulated fission, but we, we're not so concerned about stimulated radioactive, radioactive decay. Um, uranium naturally transmutates to thorium, okay? When an alpha particle is emitted. Why is that? Because, right, thorium has an atomic number that is two less than uranium. So that's why you know it's thorium, okay? Now, it's a particular isotope of thorium, okay? Because it's, it's thorium-234, and there's more than one type of thorium, okay? But that's the particular type of thorium that's, that's formed when uranium-238 decays through alpha decay, okay? All right, so natural transmutation. And notice, notice kind of the form. It's almost set up like if, you, if you've seen chemistry equations, right? This is set up like a balanced chemistry equation where you've got an equal number of charge and, uh, and basically on both sides, okay? So this is, this is then showing thorium decaying into protactinium, or, or, or protactinium, excuse me, I left a syllable off there, right? And we know it's gonna be protactinium because notice what happens. It goes up by an atomic number because why? Because we got an electron emitted. We did beta decay. And beta decay always increases the atomic number, leaving the atomic mass unchanged. So we went from thorium-234 to protactinium-234. Pretty cool, right? But we definitely changed the element, okay? All right, and that's because we eject an electron. Notice the way that the electron is represented in this notation because it is represented with a negative one to represent its charge and a zero because it carries away no mass. Now, in reality, it does have mass, but it's about a thousand times less massive. So it's, it's gonna be so small in terms of the actual effect of the atomic mass number, okay? All right, all right, cool. So when an, when an element injects an alpha particle and a beta particle, the atomic number of the resulting element is what? Okay, so both, but if both, both happen simultaneously or in, in, rapid, in rapid succession, what, what would it be? Figure this out, this is good for understanding. Okay, two, because the alpha particle has an atomic number of two, okay? Ejection of the alpha particle means a loss of two protons. So the atomic number of the element is lower by two, okay? So when an element um, ejects an alpha particle and a beta particle, um, oh, the last one, excuse me, I forgot about this typo, I'm meaning to fix it. So this last one is just for the beta particle. Okay, and I was like, wait, that's not him. But the last one was just for, excuse me, just for the alpha particle. And we can see here, it was just, just the alpha particle being ejected. This is the one where you have the alpha particle and the beta particle. So now, so we know that the, the, we get a reduction of two with the alpha particle, but then if we follow up with the beta particle, then we're gonna add one, which means our net reduction will be one. Okay, so we're reduced by one because we subtract two for the alpha, but then we get one back from the beta, sort of, right? We turn a neutron into, into a proton, and there we go, right? Now we've gone, our net change is one in terms of the atomic number. Okay, so, and sorry, sorry for that typo. Okay, so artificial transmutation. I said we wouldn't talk about it much, but I guess we'll talk about it briefly. Um, one way to do it is to crash an alpha particle into an element that can force it to become something else. So in this case, we're taking an alpha particle. Now notice the alpha particle is actually represented here by helium. That was actually the same in a couple slides back. And that's because after all, it is a helium, a helium nucleus. It's, it's ionized helium because it's, it's helium without any electrons. Neutral helium would have two electrons, okay? Ionized helium has no electrons. It's an alpha particle, right? That's the name we give it. It's because it's so special and so common, okay? So if we bombard nitrogen 14, okay, with an alpha particle, we actually get oxygen 17. And because of conservations of, of other things besides this charge, we also um, lose one hydrogen. Okay, so it becomes oxygen and then a hydrogen kind of gets knocked out of the way at high speed, okay? So that's an example of stimulated transmutation. So atoms can transmute into completely different atoms in, well, you know it, both A and B, right? 
They do it in the laboratory. They've done all kinds of wild examples, creating huge elements that are way bigger than uranium that only last, last for nanoseconds and all kinds, all kinds of variations. Some of, them, some of them don't want to happen. You have to force it a lot of energy, but there's just an incredible like, just kaleidoscope of different ways we can change elements into each other. Okay? So an element emits one beta particle and its, and, and, its product, and its product then emits one alpha particle. The atomic number of the resulting element is changed by, I bet you know, Negative one, because it's the same as before, but just just different order, right? Beta first, then alpha. But the change, the, the order doesn't matter. The net change is the same. A reduction of one in the, in terms of the atomic number. All right. So radiometric dating. So Earth's atmosphere is continuously bombarded, bombarded by cosmic rays, which cause many atoms in the upper atmosphere to transmute. Okay. These transmutations result in many protons. A nitrogen that captures a neutron and becomes an isotope of carbon by emitting a proton. Okay. See, there's that, there's that process. So we have a lot, a, lot of, a lot of just free protons, okay? So carbon-14 is a beta emitter and decays back to nitrogen, okay? So and there's a lot of carbon-14 out there. We, you kind of, you'll breathe it in as, you know, it's naturally occurring in the atmosphere. So all living organisms are taking in carbon-14. Because living plants take in carbon dioxide, they pick up carbon-14. Lost, um, lost by decay is immediately replenished by fresh carbon-14. Okay, because it is, it's constantly decaying. It has a pretty fast half-life. Well, you know, relatively fast, right? Not millions of years or anything, right? So, it's, so you're, 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 you're constantly keeping, any living creature will have an, a proportion of carbon-14 in them equal to the environment because we're all in constant contact with the environment. Now, you could have some extreme case where you take someone and lock them in a room and, you know, they're not in contact with the environment, right? Maybe they're filtering out all the carbon-14. Yeah, in, in that particular circumstance. And maybe for some, you know, exotic cave organisms that are cut off from the, you know, the outside atmosphere. Maybe, maybe that would be a fascinating example of whether there's not, you know, but, but all, almost in all cases, carbon-14 is the same in all living things. However, when animals die, they, they can't replenish the carbon-14. They're not taking, there's no, there's no process. There's no, there's no breathing. There's no, there's no respiratory process, right? Whether it's plant breathing or animal breathing, right? And so that means that then the carbon-14 is a fixed amount that then just gradually deplenishes. So that means you can look at a dead organism, find out how much carbon-14 there is in it, and find out how old it is, all right? So the relative amounts of carbon-12 to carbon-14 enable dating of organisms, okay? So you can consider something that is 22,000, a skeleton, for example, right? Because there would be carbon-14 would be locked up in the skeleton, right? Becoming carbon-12, um, because the carbon-14 becomes carbon-12, okay? All right? And so um, 20, 22,000 years ago, the skeleton was created. Over time, right, we have a reduction in the amount of carbon-14. Notice the half-life, 5,730 years. We're cutting the amount in half, okay? It never goes to zero because half-lives never go to zero right? because there's so many of these elements. You never get down to the last one, right? There's, there's, there's just too many. There's you know, trillions of trillions of them. But the point, the point is that you have a half-life of 5,730 years and thus half as much carbon-14 after each subsequent 5,730 years. Okay, so the half-life of carbon-14 is about 5,730 5, years, which means that the present amount in your bones will reduce to zero. Ah, you know the answer. Never. It never reduces to zero. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much for watching or listening to this lecture. I hope it has been very interesting and informative, and you've you know, enjoyed talking about some of these ideas of the nucleus, the strong force, and radiometric dating.